Hi everyone, let me begin this video by introducing myself. I am Mushnab Kuthari. I am a qualified fellow actuary. I have been professionally teaching actuarial science for the past eight and a half years and have overall actuarial experience of eight and a half years as well along different verticals in actuarial. So that was a brief introduction regarding me. Before we get started with the solution discussion video, I just wanted to let you all know that the new batches for IFOA April 2025 session is starting off 6th of October. Uh, even for ones who are not appearing from IEI in the November term and are planning to start with their exams from IEI May 2025 session, the batches are starting from 6th of October itself. Do note that at Fanatics, uh, we hold one single batch itself for the entire term, be it for IEI and IFOA. Obviously, we have kept in mind that IA exams will be getting over in November. So we would be you know, scheduling our classes accordingly so that once uh, who join us later, who is giving their IA exams in November, they can also continue with the, our uh, batch itself. Do keep in mind, we have uh, limited intakes for our live batches. So it's important that if you're looking forward to you know getting full services from us in terms of you know live classes, doubt clearing, ample time from the faculty, the earlier you join, the better. We would be holding classes in live offline format in Calcutta, live online classes, as well as pre-recorded lectures. So from wherever you might be, uh, any state in India or outside India, it doesn't matter. Uh, you would be getting access to all the classes along with proper doubt clearing support right from day one itself. So it's not that uh, you would be left to prevent, you know, clear your doubts yourself and you would have to post them in a particular forum where the faculty might or might not, you know, uh, answer it. Uh, all the doubts here at Fanatics is taken by me and my colleague Gunjan itself. So we both of us are qualified fellow actuaries, uh, credentialed as well. That is, we uh, are allowed to use FIA credentials from IFOA. So whatever doubts you have, you know, these would be resolved by us, not by any other junior faculty. Uh, we believe that uh, doubt clearing is one of the most important aspects of classes, and that is something which should be left for the experts itself and not to others uh, who might be able to help maybe in certain uh, basic doubts, but not for the more complicated ones. So uh, that's something regarding our classes. And, you know, uh, I firmly believe, you know, I even others uh, around, you know, who, who are similar minded along with my colleague that it is very important for students to start with the preparation very early on so that they have buffer time later on, you know, in case of any uh, externalities or anything you know, negative or anything uncontrollable, there's a buffer time so that their preparation is not hampered. So, uh, you know, to motivate or, you know, to incentivize our students to, you know, start preparing early, uh, maybe take a couple of days or a week's break after examinations have got over in the September term, but don't deviate further. Uh, I mean, if you have signed up with actual science, exams are going to be a part of life. Uh, if you enjoy it, uh, you should anyway get started with it very soon so that you can enjoy more. If you don't enjoy it, the sooner you can get something off which you don't enjoy is better. So in whichever way you bring it, I'll always have reasons, you know, to incentivize all to join early on because that just makes logical sense to me and should be the case which I feel most should be following. So as part of that, uh, we would be offering early bird offers for students who are enrolling between 15th to 30th September. Uh, these would be on a first come first serve basis only uh, since we have a single batch and a limited intake. So uh, all these offers are till the time we have seats available for the live batches. Beyond that, I mean, one can any day you know, enroll for the video batches at any point of the year. But uh, beyond a particular capacity, we won't be enrolling more students for a batch. You know, to ensure that all our students get sufficient time from the main faculties itself. So we would be multiple offers in terms of uh, maybe flat reduction and fees of certain papers, combo fees, so on. So for those details, you know, you can drop us a WhatsApp message and uh, further discussion regarding that can be made. So that's what all from my end. Uh, hope the solution discussion video is helpful to you all. So let's get started with the discussion for CS1 paper A. Overall, I found this to be you know, or you know, in terms of difficulty, similar to you know the past years, nothing very difficult as such. Obviously, there were a couple of questions which tested uh, you know students to apply the knowledge in a slightly different way. But I mean that is expected. Some proportion of the paper should you know have such marks. 
But other than that, I mean, there were a lot of questions, you know, which was straightforward, vanilla type question, which tends to, you know, uh, keep coming in CS1 papers. So in terms of pass marks overall, what I feel is it should be anywhere between 56 to 60. So now getting started with the discussion. So first of all, I mean, do make sure that you are checking the comments section as well in case you feel there are any sort of computational errors or errors in the solution. Do let us know through the comments section. We'll definitely take a look into same. And in case there is any rectifications, we will be pushing it to the comments section itself and we would be pinning it as well. So, you know, do refer to that at whichever point of time you are referring to this particular video. And if you find this video useful or uh, definitely, you know, do like it and you know share it with your friends and peers as well who would have sat for CS1 or might be preparing for CS1 at a future stage. So the first question what we had was a very straightforward question uh, from Poison distribution and the second part was from exponential distribution. So this is the first part, it's straightforward. If you want, you could have used even actual tables to get the answer, but uh, we don't know whether you know uh, full marks would be awarded or not because uh, it's two marks and uh, it's three marks. So if we're directly taking from actual tables, I guess you might get one and a half or two, but you know, uh, certain marks or let's say around one to one and a half marks, at least I would say would be for these two steps. So uh, what I'm getting is 0 0.090204. Second part is, you know, why is falling exponential 1 by 75? This is the probability we're looking for and ultimately it reduces to 0.875173. Next was second question again, uh, slightly different, but because it was MCQ the first part and if you would have observed carefully, you know, you would have been able to eliminate all the options, uh, leaving one. So the lambda values can lie between 0 to 1 only. If we just ignore that for the timing, let's say it would have been anywhere between zero to infinite. The posterior distribution would be nothing but a conventional gamma distribution. So this is how it would look like. But now because there's a restriction that lambda lies between zero to one. So what it means is maximum value which lambda can take is one. Now, if you would recall that whenever you want to put an upper cap, we need to use a minimum function. And when we need to put a lower cap, we use the maximum function. So therefore the mode of gamma, you know, with parameters alpha and lambda is alpha minus one by lambda, extending that to the revised parameters, it comes out as n plus k minus one divided by summation xi. Now this would have been the normal mode under all or nothing loss. That's the Bayesian estimate, the mode of the posterior, but maximum value subject to you know, lambda being between zero to one. So whenever this value is more than one, you know, the, our estimate would be restricted to one only. So therefore it would be minimum of one comma n plus k minus one divided by summation xi, which is option A. Now this is something, you know, a lot of you might have struggled how this minimum is summing, even though if you have not understood, if you were sitting in the exam, if you will see all the options, there was just one option where the, you know, numerator matched n plus k minus one by summation xi. In the rest, all other cases, it was different. So these are the techniques you need to develop, you know, even if you don't know how to solve the question in full, if it's MCQ based, you know, you can take an educated guess, you can eliminate certain options and, you know, get the answer. More so, you know, for ones who are planning to appear from IA, uh, some of you know would have again started to sit for exams from both the institutes or some of you know might be planning to shift to IA. So there, the, you know, it's going to be MCQ in nature. So these are the things which you need to keep in mind, which will just make your life easier. And from exam point of view, these are the techniques, how to solve certain questions without solving in full to get the answer. You just look at options and, you know, you can eliminate a lot of them. And, you know, you can uh, kind of, you know, apply these. Part two, you know, comment on why the answer in part one needs to involve the minimum because it's a truncated one. Lambda lies between zero to one. So whenever this estimate crosses one, that is not possible. It needs to be maximum of one itself. And therefore this minimum function comes into the picture. Next was question three, a rather straightforward question, I would say. This is the solution or it was verify whether alpha and beta these values one way, you know, you substitute the values and then you see that the mean and variance are coming to same. I have used a slightly longer solution, you know, just deriving the alpha and beta values over here. And I'm getting into as two and three Z I'm getting as 60 by 61. Then the patient credibility estimate is 60 by 61 into five by 300 plus one by 61 into 0.6. Originally the mistake I made was I just multiplied by five, but then I realized it's a proportion. So, you know, this is registered for 300 and it was coming out as 0 0.026230, which is very, very close to, you know, 5 by 300 itself. 
So we'll see that the value of Z is very close to one. And as such, most of our estimate or credibility will rely on the sample value itself. And therefore this is closer to the value of five by 300, which is nothing but one by 60. Next was question four. This was again, you know, one of those questions which I find a lot of students really found difficulty in. Uh, but at least, you know, part two is something, even if you did not get part three was something you could have done. Part four, you could have done. Part five, you could have done. Once the part two is given, you know, you know the CDF, you can differentiate this to find the PDF. Once you have the PDF, you can find its mean and variance using first principles. So a lot of you got stuck maybe in part one and two, but because you have the results in part two, and that's the advantage of, you know, these show that type questions, uh, you could have been in a position to solve three, four, and five. So question four, X follows uniform zero to L by two. X is nothing but the shorter length. So that will vary between 0 to L by 2 and it's uniformly distributed. So therefore, you know, 0 comma L by 2 probability X less than X comes as 2X by L. And then this is the part 2. R is nothing but the ratio X divided by L minus X. Substituting this, we basically get the result 2R by 1 plus R, which I'm, you know, also re, uh, you know, I'm just expressing it as 1 minus 2 by 1 plus R because this will be helpful when we differentiate it. Part three, you know, when R is zero, the CDF starts from zero. When it takes a maximum value ratio lies between zero to one. So when R is one, CDF takes a value one. When you take the derivative, it's positive. So it's a non-decreasing function per se, which is what we expect from a CDF function. Part four, we've got the PDF and then I've got the expectation R, which is coming out as 0.386294. And then I find expectation A, R square. So as to you know, compute variance R, which comes out to be 0 0.0782, which is option. See, uh, this was part five rather, part four was mean. So I've done both of these together. Next is question five. Now again, again, this was one of the questions which was well attempted by students, leaving the last part maybe. But other than that, it was pretty well attempted. And I feel the proportion of marks was way higher, you know, for part one. Uh, I mean, it's a very standard type question. So, you know, it was pretty much heavy in terms of having distinction, credibility, questions per se and many things like there was no question from GLM students tend to struggle in that so you know they should have been happier at least with paper A but no questions of GLM coming in so question five over here we have theta follows gamma a comma b distribution of x given theta is given it's not a, a standard uh, distribution as such which is there in the actual tables so I will therefore not written its precise form in a short way so these are the steps in brief. Again, these are not the full steps. You might have to give more steps given it's of six marks. Part two, I mean, we'll see that it's nothing but a conjugate prior because the prior and the posterior both belong to the same family of distribution. Part three, mean I'm getting as 32 by 11. And part four is finding its uh, confidence interval. So, you know, because this is a gamma distribution, I can convert it into a chi-square distribution and then referring to the, let's say the percentage points table, I can construct its 95% confidence interval, which I was getting of this form. Next is question six. Again, you know, this was a very, very scoring question. I will say question six, be it question seven, question eight also. I mean, some of you might have struggled. Uh, it, it's part of syllabus question eight. Some of you might go and see, you know, this is their dream insurance. It's covered in detail in CS2. So this question has been asked in CS2 also. But it simply uses the concept of, you know, what center data is likelihood, so on. So nothing that you need to study CS2 to, so as to be able to attempt this question. Everything which is needed is there explained in detail in the initial part. So question six, seven are like, you know, vanilla questions should have got those right. And that was a pretty good proportion 15 and again, another 20, 35 and question eight also, you know, was very straightforward, 90 marks, so, you know, these three questions, 54 marks. And I was able to complete solving the paper in around 80 or 85 minutes or I have obviously not spent time in cross-checking all my numerical values. So some of them could be long, but even if I would have to recheck, it would be for very few questions might have taken 15, 20 minutes at max. So again, this is on paper on word. It would have been more, but it is something which I feel well prepared, well practiced students with good concepts would have been able to solve within two and a half hours. And there have been a couple of students who have interacted with who were actually able to complete it within two and a half hours. Coming to question six, A is the intercept, B is slow, E is the error or residual. Part two was in terms of commenting, you know, so over here, A16 means that if A is zero, 
uh, then you're about to you know, make, let's say, 60 claims, but that does not make sense because if someone is 80 uh, for them to you know, they won't take a policy in the first place. So not very much intuitively understandable slope here. B is nothing, uh, not slope, the intercept, I mean. B is slope, which is, let's say, minus 0.5. So what this means is as the age increases, for every unit increase in age, there shall be a reduction in the expected uh, claims by the tune of 0.5. So these are the uh, solutions for the various parts. You know, nothing different as such. Part 3, R square, 86%. Part four, you know, what R square denotes, it basically means that, you know, whatever variance has been there, 86% of it can be uh, explained by the regression model. And this is part five over here. I'm getting it as 0 0.53, minus 0 0.538, comma, minus 0 0.462. Since it does not have zero, so, you know, in part six, we can go on to reject it. Now, again, these are very precise answers which I've written, not the one, the way you need to write it in the examination as such. It needs to be slightly more detailed depending on the quantum of marks. Part 7, I'm getting it as 24.90, 45.10. Question 7, very, very straightforward, I would say. Uh, so these are the solutions. Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, again, there is zero, so we didn't check. Part 4 was probably on comments line. And then we have Part 5. Uh, now in 6, we see that, you know, in Part 5, we are reject. We don't have sufficient evidence to reject. But in the earlier part, we had this is because in 1, we were looking at absolute values. We had very high absolute positive value, so we were having sufficient evidence to maybe reject it's not. But over here, we see that uh, it's a relative difference. So when the values are higher, that is causing higher absolute differences, but relative differences within the range. And therefore, you know, when you're performing it on relative level, we have insufficient evidence to check H not. Part 7, prediction interval, you know, some of you, I don't know if some of you refer to the old material 2019 or earlier. This prediction interval is something which has been added slightly later. So keep in mind, do uh, use the latest active material which is available. Might not always be the latest year 24, you could use even 23, 22. And even if you have any other version, all these changes from one version to another is available on the website of Acted. Do make sure to you know, refer to it. Else, if you're purchasing material from II, you tend to get the recent most material. If you happen to purchase from Acted, you again get the recent most material in case you're using it from a senior or your friend. So it might be a different version. It is still good to be used. Just see the changes. If there is any fundamental big change, then you might need the recent material. But as the changes are such, you know, you can use the CMP upgrade, which highlights the changes from one version to another. Okay. Last question was questioning if x follows exponential lambda. Why it is censored? Because, you know, we have no exact information about the claims which are of size greater than m. This is the likelihood. I'm getting it. Part 3 over here. So this is what I'm getting in part 4, 2.425 into 10 to the power minus 4. Part 5 is mean, which is roughly 4123.71. Part 6 is CRN. We have skipped the steps in terms of doing the expectation and all. It comes out as roughly 2.0208 into 10 to the power minus 10. And last is the confidence interval. So first I've got for lambda hat, and then I can take reciprocal of this and I'll get it for me. Note that this is the larger value. So when I take reciprocal of it, this will come out as 3699. You need to change the order. For x, if your confidence interval is a comma b, then for 1 by x, it will be 1 by b comma 1 by a. Because 1 by b will be smaller than 1 by a, so you need to change it. So you cannot usually represent confidence interval as 100 comma 80. The smaller value needs to be first, the larger value needs to be later. So this was regarding the paper. Hope you all find the video useful. Thanks everyone.